I think you do too. I think every single person that lives wants to be happy. I think that's why people chase after what they chase after, longing and looking for happiness. The real question is, how can I be happy? How do I get that happiness that I long for? And so if you ask that question, you just need to turn to the first psalm in the book of Psalms. This first song really answers that question for us and shows us how you can be happy. The big idea of this song, it's doctrinal, it's something we learn from, but it's ultimately a song to be sung by the Lord's people and has been since it was written. The point, the big idea of this is the happiness of saints and the misery of sinners. The happiness of saints, those who have been reconciled to God through his Redeemer, and the misery of those who remain on their own and are not trusting in and submitting to the Lord's redeeming King, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the big idea, the happiness of saints and the misery of sinners. Look at the very first word in this psalm. What is it? Blessed or blessed. What's the very last word in this psalm? Look at it. (laughs) Perish. The way of the wicked will perish. So it begins with the happiness. So blessed, that word, you could translate it happy. It doesn't mean blessed in the sense that people in 21st century used the word blessed. How are you? I'm so blessed. Or the Lord has blessed me with all these things. This word means happy, joyful. Happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. And then it ends with, but the way of the wicked will perish. This song contrasts the happiness of God's saints who've been redeemed by his son, the Lord Jesus, and the the misery, the perishing of the wicked, of sinners. The first thing that I want to draw your attention to is just simply what is in these first three verses of this song. And it's the happiness of the saints. And then the second thing you see as you get into verse 4, verses 4 through 6, deal primarily with the misery of sinners. The happiness happiness of saints and the misery of sinners. So as we look under this first verse, heading the happiness of saints I'll ask you or I'll ask you five times would you be happy do you want to be happy if so then this and then the sixth thing that you see in verse three is what the happy saint actually looks like five questions I'll ask or five times rather I'll ask do you want to be happy and then we see the answer to that right here In these first two verses. Thomas Watson, my favorite Puritan, says of this psalm that this psalm carries blessedness on the cover. It begins where we all hope to end up. It may well be called a Christian's guide, for it discovers the quicksands where the wicked sink down to perdition and the firm ground on which saints tread to glory. This psalm discovers the quicksands by which sinners sink down into hell, and it discovers the firm ground on which saints walk as we walk towards heaven. First question, first time, do you want to be happy? Then do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. You want to be happy? The first part of verse 1, look at it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. This is how God's songbook begins. It explicitly begins by saying if you want to be happy, you have to refrain from doing some things. You refrain from walking. Walking has to do with your ordinary course of life. You will not walk in the counsel of the wicked. That first word in there, blessed or blessed, 
It's not in the singular, it's in the plural in Hebrew, the original language that David wrote this song in. What does that mean? It means it's not just talking about one blessing. It's not just saying, happy is the man. It's saying, the man, the saint, has happiness. Continual happiness. That's why when we sing this psalm, according to the 1650 Scottish Psalter, how does it go? That man hath perfect blessedness. That man hath perfect blessedness, who walketh not astray in counsel of ungodly men, nor stands in sinner's way. It's blessedness, it's happiness. Happiness keep, keep being produced by the Lord and his grace. So you could say that what David is saying is, Oh, the blessedness of the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. What he's saying is happy. Happiness belongs to the man who does not give wicked counsel to others and does not listen to the wicked advice of people that do not love God. You want to be happy? Do not listen to the counsel of people who do not love God and walk according to his commands. Boys and girls. Boys and girls. If you want to be happy, do not listen to people who do not love Jesus. If you want to be happy, do not listen to people and take their advice and do what they say to do unless they love Jesus. You will get a lot of counsel in your lives. That means somebody giving you advice, what you should think, what you should do. And children, you need to hear right at the beginning. If you want to be sad, if you want to be miserable, listen to the advice of people that don't care about Jesus. But if you want to be happy, look to the people who love the Lord Jesus Christ and want to obey him. And all of their advice to you is coming from what God says in his word. And then you will be happy. Happiness belongs to the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. And so I ask you, men, women, boys, and girls, whose counsel do you listen to? Whose advice do you take? Look at the beginning of the songbook of God and see that it begins, though this is not the first song written that's compiled in this book. But when it was compiled, they took this song that David wrote and put it at the very beginning because it's the foundation of all of our life in obedience to God and being happy in him. Happy or happiness belongs to the man who does not walk, who does not direct his life based on the advice given by those who don't love God. Think about the life direction, or the direction that you're going in your life. The job that you've taken, your vocation, the way you spend your time, the way you spend the money God has given you, the things that you think about, the things that you do, the things that you wear. I mean, everything about your life. Why do you do the things that you do and think the things that you think? Is it according to the counsel of The advice of people who don't love Jesus? It's just generally accepted in society that this is what you do and this is what you think and this is how your life walks? Or do you actually want to be happy? And base everything that you think and do on what is written in the word and wise advice given by people who love the Lord Jesus. If you want to be happy, do not walk in the counsel of Of the wicked. The wicked are not just those who are vehemently opposed to the Lord. The wicked are those who are not reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. The wicked in this context are not necessarily immoral people, they could be very moral people, but they're not saints. They're not clothed in the righteousness of Christ. They're not forgiven of their sin. They don't have the spirit of God. 
Their foundation and their standard is not the word of God. And therefore, however moral they look, if they are still unrepentant and don't trust in the Lord's Savior, they are still wicked. Do you listen to them? David begins this psalm by saying, the happy, the happy man doesn't listen to the counsel of the wicked. Second, would you be happy? Then do not stand in the way of sinners. So first he begins with, you don't listen to the counsel of those who don't love God. You don't take anybody's advice for what you should think or do. If they don't love God and their standard is not the word of God and are living to glorify God, you'll be unhappy if you do that. The second is standing in the way of sinners. He's saying happiness belongs to the man who will not stand among those who will not stand in the judgment. This has to do with the the ordinary way of your life and the fellowship that you have. What I mean by that is your close friendships. Who do you hang out with? Who do you spend your time with? Whose way do you stand in? David is saying, if you want to be happy, you don't stand in the way of sinners. If you don't have intimate friendships with those who don't love the Lord, you want to to be happy, your intimacy, your friendships, your bosom buddies, as you could say, it's the righteous. It's those who are counted righteous in Christ and are living to glorify God. If you want to be happy, then do not stand in the way of sinners. Again, Watson points out, the godly man shakes off all intimacy with the wicked. He may traffic with them, not associate. He may be civil to them as neighbors, but not twist into a cord of friendship. Diamonds and stones may lie together, but they will not solder and cement. Whose way do you stand in? What friendships do you have? What fellowship do you keep? You can see how they're even connected, can't you? Those whose way you stand in is typically those who are giving you the counsel that you listen to. Happiness belongs to the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners. And third, he says, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So if you want to be happy, then do not sit in the seat of scoffers. Walk, stand, sit. Do you see how he's talking about all of life and he's using this language to help us have a picture of it? What way do you walk? Do you listen to the counsel of the wicked and that's why you walk where you walk? Who do you stand with? And then he's saying, what seat do you sit upon? This has to do with sitting in some sort of judgment over God and scoffing at him. So the question you need to then ask, backtrack this. Look at all of what he said. Happiness belongs to the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Look at all of it. If you stand in the way of sinners and you walk according to the counsel of the wicked, you're most likely going to end up sitting in the same seat that those people do who mock God. Who, and what that means is they hear about who God is, That he is just. He is righteous. And they say, nah, it doesn't matter. The Lord's never going to call me to account. Or they hear a command of the Lord and they say, I don't have to obey that. Or they hear a way that the Lord works and does something and they say, well, I don't think that's the way God should do things. That's what it means to be a scoffer. You scoff at the promises of God, you scoff at his person, scoff at his providence. David, or the psalmist later says in Psalm 26, verse 4, I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort 
with hypocrites. I don't sit with men of falsehood. I don't consort with hypocrites. I do not sit in the seat of scoffers. Happiness belongs to the man who has nothing to do with sitting in judgment over God's person, God's precepts, God's promises, or God's providence. Though those who mock God by scoffing at these things, they may feel an instant delight. But ultimately, David's saying that way leads to death. Maybe you've been there before. You scoff at the Lord's person. You scoff at his promises. You mock his commands, his precepts in the word. Or you look at the way that he works in the world, or has worked as revealed in the scriptures in the past, and you mock You say, that's not the way it should be done. That's not what I would do. Maybe you've done that. And it probably, in the moment, felt really good to you. Sinners love to mock God. They love to sit in the seat of scoffers in judgment over the Lord. But You need to know that though at that initial moment someone's scoffing at the Lord, it may feel good. But it's just like drinking wine that's laced with poison. It may initially taste good, but you have drunk in damnation. The end of that mockery is sickness and death. And you, if you surround yourself with people, or you have close fellowship with people who sit in the seat of scoffers, you are going to have their poisonous vomit come out on you, and it will taint you as well. Happiness belongs to the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So the next time that you question what God is doing in a way, you say, in a scoffing type of tone, or with the spirit of scoffing at him, rather than, Rather than a humble, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. Not that, but I don't know what the Lord's doing. You're doing that? You need to remember the beginning of the book of Psalms. That doesn't end in happiness. Happiness belongs to the man who does not sit in the seat of scoffers. So there are all the negatives. Negatives are important. Negations are important. You want to be happy? Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. And then notice he doesn't end there. Christianity is not primarily or exclusively about we don't do this, we don't do this, we don't do this. Though there are many things that we who belong to Jesus say, no, we have to reject this. You want to be happy? No listening to the counsel of the wicked. No standing in the way of sinners. No sitting in the seat of scoffers. But, he says, look at the first part of verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. All of this is still building off of the blessedness or happiness belongs to the man, dot, 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 whose delight is in the law of the Lord. So if you want to be happy, then get delight in the scriptures. You want to be happy, get delight in what God has revealed in his word. What does David mean by his delight is in the law of the Lord? He doesn't just mean, I don't think, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. He means at this moment in history what they have revealed to them in the scriptures. The Bible that they have so far. And most of all, what they've got is the law of the Lord. The first five books of your Bible. What Moses wrote. He's not talking just about the law of the Lord or the rules of the Lord alone, but he's talking about the scriptures, what God reveals to you and I in his word. If you want to be happy, then make your delight in the law of the Lord. If this is you, if you truly do delight in God's word, you delight in reading it, hearing it preached, meditating on it, seeking to live according to what God says, then you need to stop right now and thank God for his grace. 
you were not born that way. You were not born somewhere in the middle. You were born inheriting sin from your parents who inherited it from their parents who inherited it all the way back from Adam. You were born dead in your trespasses and sins at enmity with God. Hating God. Not wanting to submit to God. Not listening to his law and delighting in it. So if you... Beloved, if you delight even at all in the word of God, then praise him for his grace who transformed you as you heard the gospel. God the Holy Spirit came and changed your heart, set you free from your sin, gave you faith in the Lord Jesus, and put new desires in you so that you could say along with David, my delight is in the law of the Lord. If you don't delight in God's word. If you don't delight in the scriptures, then you need to know you're not a Christian. Christians love God's word. There are different degrees. Some of us and some of you have been walking with Jesus much longer. You've been killing your sin daily much longer than some of the rest of us. Your delight in the law of the Lord far surpasses ours. But some of you who are still immature in the faith, still weak in the faith, your delight in the word of God may be much smaller. But you need to hear me no matter where you're at, if you are in Christ, if your faith is truly in Jesus, you do delight in listening to, reading, memorizing God's word. And if you want to be more and more happy The happy man makes his delight the law of the Lord. You need to know that if you don't love God's word, you need to be born again. If you don't love what God has revealed, if you don't love the scriptures, you are dead. And you need God to give you life. You need something to happen to you that you can't make happen. You need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he came to the earth lived without sin, went to the cross and was willingly crucified in place of sinners, taking what we deserve. Three days later, after his death, he arose from the dead as the Savior of everyone who will trust in him. You need to hear that basic good news, that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Hear that. And you need God to make that go deep and change you. So that you would now delight to trust in Jesus and submit to Jesus. And that your delight would become in the law of the Lord. So if that's you and you're saying, I don't delight in God, I don't delight in Jesus. Then go to God right now in prayer and say, God, make me alive. Cause me to be born again. I want that delight in Christ. If you don't have it, go to him now. Trust in Jesus now. And he'll give you that delight. If you want to be happy, you've got to be like Jeremiah in Jeremiah 15, 16. Who says to the Lord, your words were found by me and I ate them. And they became to me the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name. Jeremiah, in discovering God's word, he says, Your words were found by me, and I devoured them. This is what we mean by studying the scriptures. Not just a cursory reading. You don't think and try to figure out what is God saying through this author. Studying the scriptures looks like how Jeremiah says, devouring it. I'm feasting on it. Your words were found by me and I ate them. And they became to me the delight of my heart. If if you have little delight in the word of God, I promise you, you have little happiness. I know you do. Because happy is the man who makes his delight in the law of the Lord. Pray for God to give you that deep delight in the scriptures like he gave Jeremiah, like he gave David, like he gives his mature saints. 
You know how you foster that delight more and more? You read the scriptures and study the scriptures and hear preaching from the scriptures more and more. You want to delight more in the word of God? Study more of the word of God. If you're still immature in the faith, I know that you read the Bible and you go, I don't know what that was. There are a lot of times you go, I don't know what that means. What does he mean when he says that? But the more familiar you get with the scriptures, the more delight you get from it, because you're going to see, oh, I get what he's saying. I remember reading this in Matthew. I remember reading this in Judges, and that helps shine light on what God is saying. The best commentary on scripture is other scripture. And the more you get familiar with the word of God, the more you're going to understand what he's saying, and you're going to get beyond just going, I have no idea. And you're going to get deeper into the delight. So if you want to be happy, then get a delight in the scriptures. Chiefly, firstly, by looking to Christ Jesus in faith. Trusting in him. Then you foster that delight by growing in your knowledge of the scriptures. Boys and girls... Children, will you look at me in my eyes? If you want to be happy, learn how to love the Bible. You truly want to be happy, memorize the Bible. Get a delight in what God has revealed in his word. Boys and girls, if you want to be happy, go to your dad. Or if you don't have a dad in your house, go to your mom and say, Teach me the Bible. That will make you more and more and more happy. If you want to be happy, then get a delight in the scriptures. Next, he doesn't only say his delight is in the law of the Lord. Look, he says, and on his law, he meditates day and night. So, beloved, do you want to be happier tomorrow than you were today? Do you want to be possessing that happiness then meditate on the scriptures. Meditate on the scriptures. Happy is the man who meditates on God's word day and night. Meditation is one of those lost arts of Christianity where in our day you talk about meditation and I think most people go, what are you talking about, like Hindu stuff, Buddhist stuff? That's Christian stuff. In Genesis 26, or rather Genesis 24, Moses writes, And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. What does it mean to meditate? It means to get alone, and based on what God has said to you in the scriptures, you think about it. You fill your thoughts with what God reveals about himself and about you and his promises and his warnings, you fill your thoughts and you think about what God reveals in the scriptures. That's what meditation means. So Joshua says to God's people at the beginning of that book, in Joshua 1.8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate upon it day and day. And night. Your thoughts are filled with the scriptures. And so Paul exhorts us. Whatever is true. Whatever is honorable. Whatever is just. Whatever is pure. Whatever is lovely. Whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence. If there is anything worthy of praise. Think about these things. What's Paul doing in Philippians 4.8? He's saying, meditate on these things. Meditate on the scriptures. Meditate on what God has revealed to you. Think about them. Eight times in Psalm 119, the longest chapter in your Bible, that has to deal with the written word of God. Eight times in that psalm, David says he meditates on the word of God. I I think David says he meditates in Psalm 119 more times than you've probably ever meditated. 
than most Christians have ever just got alone and after reading the scriptures just sat there and thought, just chewed on it. Psalm 119, 97 through 99. Oh, how I love your law, David sings. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. Studying the word of God or hearing the word of God preached, that is like the tasting of the food. Meditation is the chewing and the swallowing of the food. So when you go home on the Lord's Day, after worship, after hearing the word of God preached, you're not to just go on to something else, but spend time thinking about God's word and what he says. Spend time thinking about the text of scripture that we've studied together. Don't just taste the food, chew. Meditation, or the reading and hearing of the word rather, is like the planting of seeds. And meditation on it, thinking about it. Storing it up in your heart, in your mind. It's like the watering of those seeds. Don't plant only water. Don't taste only, chew it and swallow it. If you want to be happy, then meditate on the scriptures. Day and night. Fill your thoughts with God's word. Now look at verse 3 in this song. David now gives us a metaphor, a picture So we can understand what a happy saint is like. What's a happy saint like? He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The happy saint is like a tree. Why does he say rivers plurally? You see that? Or by streams of water that yields its fruit in season. It's plural. Because in this day, what they would do is basically dig long ditches and create their own streams to get it right into an area that they would want to grow and plant trees. So imagine this. Imagine this tree being planted. And not only by one stream but by many streams weaving in and out and all around that tree. So the tree that's planted has plenty of nourishment. And then David says, its leaf does not wither. Look at all the nourishment it has. It yields its fruit in season. It produces good fruit for God's glory and for their good and the gladness of their neighbor. That's what the happy saint is like. Notice that he says, planted. Not just like a tree by streams of water, planted by the Lord. Trusting him for his grace. Looking to him alone. Making your delight in the law of the Lord and meditating on the law of the Lord day and night. And God, through that, by his grace, plants you right next to multiple streams of water. Your leaf will not wither. What does that mean? It means storms will come, lightning will strike, but if you are planted by these many streams of water, if the Lord has planted you there, if your delight is in the law of the Lord, if you're meditating on the scriptures day and night, whatever storm comes is not going to split you. Your leaf doesn't wither. You're not going to be struck down. And so your happiness continues. It yields its fruit in season. Do you want to produce good fruit for God's glory and for other people's good? Then don't. Don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. Don't stand in the way of sinners. Don't sit in the seat of scoffers, but delight in the law of God and meditate on it day and night. If you do, you'll be a happy saint. You'll be like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does he prospers. It's not 
physical, healthy, wealthy, prosperity, garbage, prospering. This is soul prospering. You'll be happy despite the storms, despite the affliction. If you are a saint, if you are giving yourself to what is revealed here in this psalm, and if, or if you would begin today, in all that you do, your soul will prosper. Though the outer flesh is wasting away, Paul says that our inner man is being renewed day by day. So there it is. You want to be happy? Look at it again. Blessedness belongs to the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Nor stands in the way of sinners. Nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. What's he like? He's like a tree. Planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither. And all that he does he prospers. And now the transition. What are the wicked like? He doesn't detail for us what the wicked do, because he's already shown us that. The wicked give wicked counsel. They stand sinning. They scoff at the Lord. They do not delight in the law of the Lord. They don't meditate on God's word day and night. They're not like a tree. Those who refuse to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him and obey him, they're not like a tree. What are they like? The wicked are not so, but are like chaff. They're like chaff that the wind drives away. You know what chaff is? After getting the harvest of your wheat, just like Boaz in the book of Ruth, you bring all of your wheat to the threshing floor, a very hard floor made out of packed in dirt or made out of stone, you bring all the wheat there, and then the owner gets his winnowing fork. It looks like a big farmer's pitchfork. And he picks up the wheat, throws it up in the air, so that then the chaff, which is all the extra stuff that's not of any benefit, is driven away in the wind. Throw it up in the air, the chaff is driven away, and the wheat falls back down. You see how he says, the happy saint is like a tree, a mighty oak planted that produces its fruit. But the wicked, those who refuse God's mercy and won't submit to him, they're like the little pieces of insignificant chaff that the wind drives away. This is your end. If you will not submit to Christ... If you refuse the redemption offered to you in the gospel, the free gift of God's mercy bought for you by Christ, if you refuse that, this is your end. The wicked aren't like trees planted by streams of water. They're like the chaff, thrown up in the air, driven away, and totally useless. John the Baptist, when he comes preparing the way of the Lord Jesus, uses this same metaphor. I think he has Psalm 1 in his mind. He says in Matthew 3.12 that Christ, when he comes, Christ's winnowing fork is in his hand. He's got that winnowing fork. And he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is your end. Sinner, if you won't repent, turn from your sin, forsake your own ways, and trust in the Lord Jesus and what he's done for us. This is your end. The Lord Jesus has his winnowing fork in his hand. He's not only the Savior, he's the judge. And if you refuse to be cleansed of your sin... And transformed from a sinner into a saint. One that God accepts through his son. If you refuse that, Jesus is going to pick you up with his winnowing fork. Throw you up into the air. And you're going to blow right into the fires of damnation forever. 
That's your end. That's what the wicked are like. That's why he says at the beginning of verse 5, look at it. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. You will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ one day. Every single one of you and me. We will stand before the Lord Jesus one day and have to give an account for every single thing that we've done. And the wages of sin, your sin against God, what you've earned, your paycheck for sin is death. The only way that you and I are delivered from that judgment that we deserve is that Jesus died in place of sinners. For everyone who comes to trust in him, his death replaces yours. But the wicked, the wicked won't stand in the judgment. Those who won't, aren't forgiven of their sin will not stand in the judgment. You know, this is not just really immoral and obviously sinful people. This is... People like you, who come to church every Sunday, but are not trusting in and submitting to Christ. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It's not because you and I are forgiven of our sin if we change and we do better. It's because if God saves you by grace, he changes you and transforms you so that you now want to obey God out of grateful joy for his free, gracious salvation in his son. On that day, the day of judgment, Jesus says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? It means preach. Preachers just like me will be in hell because preaching doesn't justify anyone. I cannot preach to make myself acceptable to God. Only his son can make me acceptable. Many will say, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, Christ says, depart from me. I never knew you. You workers of lawlessness. That's what marks the wicked. Workers of lawlessness. They, but they professed. They professed faith. They preached the faith. They cast out demons in his name. They did mighty works and wonders in his name. And Christ said, I never knew you. The wicked will not stand in the judgment. And it's not just those who are so obviously the wicked. It's any of you, and me included, if we don't submit to Christ and through faith alone trust in him. Notice that he says in the second part of verse 5, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The wicked won't stand in the judgment, and the sinners will not stand in the congregation of the righteous. Take your mind to judgment day. God's redeemed people who trust in his son and submit to King Jesus will be gathered together in festal joy. The congregation of the righteous, those counted righteous in Christ. And sinners will not stand with them. They will not here go into glory prepared for you. They will here go into the darkness prepared for the devil and his angels. The good that sinners receive in this life a lot of times is just because of their close proximity to God's saints. And the blessings that God gives his saints overflow, and sinners even participate in them. And what David is saying, sinners won't stand in the congregation of the righteous. Sinners won't be in that great congregation in heaven, on the new earth that Jesus restores and redeems. William Plummer, a great commentator on the book of Psalms, says, In this life, the holy and the unholy are 
often found together. The tares and the wheat grow together until the harvest. The sheep and the goats herd together till the chief shepherd shall appear. Then shall be made an eternal separation between God's friends and God's foes. There is a day coming to where the Lord Jesus will separate the wheat from the chaff, the wheat from the tares, the sheep who truly belong to him and the goats and you who refuse Christ. Hear that warning. You won't stand in the judgment. You'll be struck down. You won't stand in the congregation of the righteous. You'll be cast out. And look at verse 6, how he ends with this great contrast, this great difference between saints who have been saved by grace through faith and sinners who remain trusting in their own works and in themselves. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The Lord knows, this is an intimate knowing, loves the way of the righteous, but not only the wicked will perish, their way will perish. 1 John 2, 16 and 17. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. What the world prizes, pride of life, desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, what the world desires, is passing away. But the one who does the will of the Lord will last forever, abides forever. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Friends, in conclusion, just ask this question with me. How are you going to stand in the judgment? How are any of us going to be able to stand in the judgment? When all of our excuses are stripped away and all of our sins, that our rebellion against the creator stand before us to condemn us, how are we not going to be struck down as we deserve? Have we not all many times walked in the counsel of the wicked? Have you and I not at many times stood in the way of sinners and sat in the seat of scoffers? Have we not all neglected God's word, not delighted in it, filled our thoughts with evil things, not with meditating on the word of God? What do we deserve then? Oh, see that what you deserve, what I deserve, is verse 4 and verse 5. That's what you're going to get. That's what you deserve. That's what's coming for you. The wicked are like chaff that are driven away. Who of us can say, I'm not wicked. I've never done that. I've never been about that. None of us. How can any of us stand in the judgment and not be driven away to the burning like the chaff? And the answer is, the only one who has ever obeyed Psalm 1 perfectly. The Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is the truly happy man who never once walked in the counsel of the wicked. Christ, Jesus, did not ever stand, not even once, in the way of sinners. Though Christ suffered greatly, greater than you and I have ever or will ever suffer. He never sat in the seat of scoffers. The Son of God, his delight was in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditated and obeyed day and night. He is that tree of trees planted by the streams of water. And if you, if you trust in him, 
if through faith you cling to him and embrace him, then through his perfect obedience, he gives you his righteousness so that God now looks at you and says, righteous. But not only that, not only did Christ obey the law and fulfill Psalm 1 in that sense, he fulfilled the judgment promised to wicked sinners like you and me in Psalm 1. Christ not only obeyed the law of God perfectly, he willingly became the chaff. Though that great tree, he bowed himself down and allowed himself to be cut down and made as kindling for the fires of judgment in our place. Just think of it. The God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one that has ever deserved to be that tree planted by the streams of water and prosper in all he does, he was willingly chopped down and burned on the cross for our sin. The only way you can stand in the judgment is if you trust in Christ that he stood and was slaughtered in the judgment on the cross for you. The only one who could ever truly stand there willingly bowed his head and he let the sword of justice cut him to pieces in our place. That's the wonder of the cross of Jesus. If you look at Psalm 1, all the positives, he meets everyone. All the negatives that he doesn't deserve, he steps into in place of sinners, makes himself the chaff bows down his head in the judgment so that you and I could be forgiven of our sin, reconciled to God, and so that now we don't have slavish fear, wondering if God is happy with me, but you can simply refuse to walk in these ways, refuse to stand, refuse to sit in these ways, but by God's grace and trusting in Christ, you just make your delight in the law of the Lord and meditate it on it day and night. And you will be happy. The truly happy man Christ became miserable on the cross to take your misery from you so that you could be happy in him forever. Don't neglect the ways that he says you are made happy. Our Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Psalm 1. Thank you that though we are like the chaff that deserves to be blown away and burned, that Christ stood in our place and bore our guilt and shame. Please save sinners. Give new hearts to people who don't yet trust in and submit to Jesus. Transform them from miserable sinners into happy saints. Help them to trust in Christ for the first time and be forgiven and counted righteous and reconciled to you. We ask you by your great mercy to grow us who are in Christ so that we would be more like him. We'd be more like him, the perfect, happy man. So, Father, we ask you, help us not walk in the counsel of the wicked nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But we ask you, please grow our delight in your word. Help us to meditate on your word day and night and be that truly happy one. We ask you in the name of Jesus to abolish abortion. Make it illegal to kill babies. We ask you, as we go to the murder mills to preach, please rescue these babies who are being carried off to death. Rescue our neighbors. Change the minds of the parents. We ask you to purify your church. Make us more happy in just submitting to you and what you prescribe and what you reveal in the scriptures. Fill us with your spirit. We ask you to fill us with the fruit of the spirit. 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. We want to be people who delight in your word, meditate on it, and produce good fruit for your glory, others' good, and our gladness. Please make that happen. Help us to keep in step with the Spirit. Help us to love one another, Father. To love one another as your children. We ask you to convict us of our sin. And we confess that the only way we are made right with you, and the only way we even have access to you, is through the blood of your Son, through his death in our place. So we boldly come now to the throne of grace, asking you these things and praising your name. Only in the name of Jesus, our high priest. We ask you, please sanctify us in the truth. Help us to worship you now in these ways that you've prescribed in your word and to do it with joy. And it's in Christ's name we pray all these things. And if you agree with me, would you say amen? Amen. amen.